I want to thank you for joining us today for Tuesday Bible Study. We're looking at, again, the book of James, as we've been doing over the course of the last few weeks. This is our last opportunity to give a good crack at the book of James and figure out what he's trying to tell us. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessing of James and for the gift that he gave to us in this book. And pray that we continue to inspire us and uh, transform us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as I said, we've been looking at the book of James over the course of the last few weeks. And you might remember, we've, for those who are joining us maybe for the very first time, just to remind you that we've been talking about this as the anti-Pauline book. Uh, it is a response to Paul. Paul, again, was always talking about it is by grace that you are saved through faith, not of works. James is like, are you crazy, Paul? you got to work, and you got to get off your butt. And it's all about works, works, works. You remember we also talked about Luther, who called this the gospel of straw. And uh, don't make more of this than what you think. Basically what he's saying is there's no gospel content to this. You cannot read the book of James and come away and understand who Jesus Christ is and what it is he came to do for you and what it means to be saved. You can't know it. Read it sometime and say, okay, if I don't know anything about who Jesus is, what do I know, with, know about Jesus once I'm done with James? Hmm, basically nothing. You don't know anything about Jesus. It, it, it's, it's a book that assumes that you already have a relationship with Christ, and for those who have a relationship with Christ, he's concerned that they've been abusive of Paul's thoughts about grace, being saved through grace uh, by faith and not of works. He wants to make sure that hey, y'all got to get off your butt and do something because you have faith in Jesus Christ. It's going to transform the way you act. So there you go. So James, now we get into this last section and, and James is, you know, James chapter five is really intriguing. And we are only supposed to read the latter part of it that talks about um, healing and so forth. And I think that's a shame because we missed the very first part of the book of, of James uh, chapter 5, he starts talking about the rich. And here's the thing I love about this. Now remember, James is talking about our actions demonstrating our faith and our relationship with God. And the people he despises most are these stinking rich people who don't put their faith into action. Wealthy people, well guess what? The rich really stink. All right? <laughs> This is part one, and you know what? They are going to get what is coming to them. This has kind of been the cry of the poor for millennia. The rich are going to get it. Well, you know what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back and bite them in the butt eventually. And yet, how many rich people die rich with a smile on their face because, hey, they got it all in life, right? And so this is kind of that conflict that we have. We all think, oh, the rich are going to get it. And someday they're going to pay for that. And they die rich and happy. And it's just like, what? Well, James is kind of dealing with this too. Because again, he's been talking about people putting their faith into action. And he's saying the rich stink because they don't put their faith into action. They hoard it for themselves. They get rich at the expense of the poor. Wealth collected at the expense of the poor will condemn them ultimately to death. That's verses 1 to 6 in chapter 5. I'm not going to read that today because that's really not the focus, but you need to understand this when we get into the latter section that I really want to look at. So wealth collected at the expense of the poor will lead to their condemnation. And that's verses, again, 1 to 6. They will get what's coming to them, James says. Unfortunately, they seem to get away with a lot. And, they, you know, and many of them die, like I said, rich and happy and dumb and don't ever seem to pay for it. So, therefore, verse 7, he says, just be patient. Be patient. Dang, Nevin, I've been patient enough. It's been millennia, and the rich still don't seem to be paying for their behavior towards the poor. He says, well, you know what? It's going to happen. 
When? Well, actually, verse 8 to 11. It's going to happen when? When the Lord returns. Well, the rich will get their due until the Lord returns. Well, if you don't believe in the Lord, what do you care? So, uh, so this is a comment to those who are Christians. Be patient. Be patient like Job. Because in this life we may suffer. But at some point the Lord will return and will make this all right. And the are gonna, get, rich are going to get what they deserve. Because after all they stink. Until that time, verse 12, until that time, see that's why this is supposed to be 11. Don't make any vows to heaven, to earth, to anybody else. Don't commit yourself. Don't make any allegiance. Because again, especially to these people, don't make any vows, any allegiance to these people so that you can have a little easier life. That's what verse 12 is trying to tell us. Don't make any commitments that ties you into anybody else but Jesus Christ. Okay? So yes, the rich stink. And they make our life a living heck sometimes, don't they? They steal from the poor. They get wealthy on the backs of the poor. There's nothing we can do about it. This is what James says. Be patient give it to God. All right. So with that in mind, I think he would kind of agree with his sentiment that rich really have no means to get to heaven because they have exchanged their relationship with God for their wealth because they get rich at the expense of the poor. I know I've been saying this all the time, Benny Hinn. Okay, I don't even know if I'm spelling it right. Sorry, should I say that? Yes, I should. Because he's a wealthy faith healer who makes his wealth at the expense of the poor. And they keep getting poor and he takes every dime from them. It's just wrong. In the name of Jesus Christ, when you take money from the poor and become wealthy, Benny Hinn, you will stand under God's judgment. I caution you with this. If you are following faith healers or other people are getting blasted wealthy, and there's a whole lot of poor people who are more impoverished from running into this person, that person will be held accountable. This is what James is trying to say. So with that in mind, the rich stink. So let me put that up here again. Rich stink. They make our life heck. Well, and that's kind of the second part. Your life, my life, can be really crummy because of these people. So what are we supposed to do? Let's start a revolution. See, there's a lot of Christians who think that's what it means. Well, let's go start a revolution, and let's go fight for the cause of poor, and let's put a, put a gun to the head of all the rich, and let's kill them all. This is kind of what happened in, in what, in Russia, right? <laughs> years, 100, 150 years or so ago, and 100-some years ago, uh, the Russian Revolution, 100 years ago. It was, it was wow. That's, uh, at any rate, so the wealthy, I mean, we'll put them to the gun. Let's string them all up. All right, let's create a political system that favors the poor. This is nowhere in James's book. He just, this is life. This is life. And you know what? Wherever that's been tried, where the rich have been strung up, guess what happens? A new breed of rich takes place and takes her place. Isn't that what happened in a lot of the countries in South America? Communism is the answer. We're going to resolve our problem with the rich by communism. Well, we set up another group of ruling elite who become blasted wealthy on the backs of the poor. Oh, these well-meaning people. Because this is our sinful human nature. We overthrow the rich to become rich ourselves. The rich stink. And he's saying, this is life. My life is crummy because of the rich. And this is where we come into our lesson for today. So it goes right into verse 13. Is anyone suffering because of the rich? Are you suffering as a result of the fact that the rich are oppressing you? 
Now, he doesn't say it that way. I'm saying that way because that's the implication. This comes back to here. If you're suffering because of the rich, I understand that. You know, we're sitting here talking about the Lord returning someday and the rich getting what they deserve, but that's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. So what are you supposed to do until that time? Are you suffering because you are suffering at the hands of rich people who have oppressed you? What are you supposed to do? He says to you, pray. Pray for what? Pray, God, strike the rich dead. No, that's not what he says. When we pray, who are we praying for? We're praying for ourselves. In this case, that we have the strength to represent Jesus Christ even in the midst of our suffering. Wow. Really different attitude. So is any one of you suffering? He must pray. These are the imperatives. James gives us all of these different, uh, let me write this down. This isn't, I'm speaking of this in terms of an English word, imperative, our verbs. These are imperative verbs, and he's got a whole ton of them here. He's telling us how we should respond to these things. If you are suffering at the hands of the rich, pray. Pray for yourself to have the strength to see yourself through this difficult time. So uh, the great thing about all of these words, these imperatives are almost all. I didn't look at this one. I should have. But I think, uh, I, so I don't have the Greek here in front of me, but almost every single word that he does when he's giving us an imperative is, is a middle verb. Well, you know, middle tense. And you're like, what are you talking about? You're not doing English. I'm not doing English right now. I'm doing Greek. Because we don't have the middle tense in, <coughs> pardon me, in English. We only have the active tense. Oops. Uh, active uh, I should, active and, and, uh, and passive. Okay? I do this, or this is something done to me. And this is something that I'm participating in, I'm doing kind of for myself, but I understand there's something outside also acting upon me as well. So when you're praying, you are an active participant in prayer, but with the idea that it's also something being done to you and for you. That's where this middle tense comes in. There is absolutely no way to translate into English in any way that makes any flippant sense, except to say this again, when you pray, you are a participant in the prayer for yourself, that's why it's middle, but the power of that prayer is coming from the outside, from God. That's why James uses this, it's very interesting, he uses all of these middle tense verbs, pray, you know, Luther would always say, and, and I, I, I do wonder, I, I haven't read enough of Luther to know whether theologically this is where he comes down from this, but Luther would always say, pray as though it all depends upon God. Work as though it all depends upon you. Okay? And I, and I wonder if that, that's kind of what this middle tense is. We pray as though we're giving it all to God, but we are participants. We are active participants in this. So we pray. We give ourselves to God because we want to represent God when we pray uh, in this life, even though the rich stink and they're oppressing us. And then he goes on. Well, you know what? Not everybody thinks life is crummy. So what does he say? Um, is anyone cheerful? Okay, so if you're, I have no clue what I am doing here. There we go. My life is crummy. If I'm suffering, pray. If I am cheerful, what should you do? So he says, if you're cheerful, hmm, if anyone's cheerful, sing. Sing. Sing praises to God. How fantastic is that? Oh, but he's not done. He's got one other thing he wants to tell us. So, my life is crummy. If it's crummy, if some suffering on account of the rich, 
pray. If I'm cheerful, life is okay, the rich haven't gotten to me yet, well, sing praises. Because in all things, every circumstance, James is trying to tell us is an opportunity to turn to God. If your life is great, you turn to God. If your life is crummy, you turn to God. See how that works? No matter what your circumstances are. And then he goes on and he says this, if you are sick. Now this is interesting. And we're going to spend the rest of it. Now let me actually erase this because uh, I want to get this sick all the way up here. But you can kind of see his logic, I hope, and what he's doing. If any one of you is sick, because this one he's going to spend a little bit of time on. If anyone is sick, um, sick or another translation of this is weak. But he's definitely referring to some type of physical circumstance. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you have cancer. Although if you have cancer, he's including you in this. You may not have understood what cancer was in those days. Nevertheless, if you are some type of physical ailment, some type of sickness, it could be you are emotionally distraught because of the circumstances in your life. That's a physical thing. People who are depressed and are going through times of despair, this is something that's happening to you physically. You feel like you just can't get out of bed. And you can understand if you're oppressed by the rich, there are times you just feel like, why bother? I'm going to lose today anyway. All of those things are physical things. They affect us very deeply. So he is kind of including all of this. And that word sick that we translate sick could refer to all of those things. So if you're sick, generically, whatever it is, call, he says, he says this, then call the elders. So let me put, again, these are the imperatives. I'll put the imperatives in blue, or green. Call, he says call, and pray. And here's the thing, pray again. Oops, call the elders. Have them pray over you. But guess what? Remember how we sit, talked about these middle tense verbs? These are both middle tense verbs. You are not passive in this prayer life. You are a participant, and you are inviting other people in to your circumstance. You are saying, I can't do this by myself. I need help. I can't do this. I have to do this. I have to put my effort into this. But I'm running out of energy. My, you know, this is how much I got accomplished. But guess what? I can only get this far. I need help. Please. It's the hardest thing in the world to do is come and ask people for help. But you are inviting the elders, in this case, to be participants in your prayer life so that you can overcome this sickness, this physical weakness, whatever it may be, okay? And he goes on and he asks, he says that uh, the elders, what they should do then is anoint. Now in this case, this is not a middle verb. You're not anointing yourself. They are anointing you. They certainly, it actually means to pour over top of yourself the oil. They're, they're gushing you with oil, okay? And this is, this is actually uh, the word Messiah, the anointed one. That's what that word Messiah means, the anointed one, the one whom has, has been, oil has been poured over top of them. Now, that doesn't mean you're, I don't want to, you're not the Messiah, okay? But I'm just saying that that's where the imagery comes from, the anointed one of God. That's where that uh, Messiah comes from. In this case, you're anointed by the elders of the church. That anointing re uh, by oil represents the Holy Spirit, okay, in the church, in the life of the church. We are calling upon the Holy Spirit to fall upon this person. Now, James doesn't directly say that, but he says that kind of in a, in a roundabout way by be asking us to be anointed with oil. The Christians would get that, okay? He's not trying to flesh out his entire theology here. So he's assuming that we have an understanding of what it means to be anointed with oil. Uh, Luther would, would actually call this, um, he, he would say that we in the Church of, of Christ, uh, the Lutheran Church, have 
two and a half sacraments. This would be the half sacrament. Um, and I, I think he's kind of wrong with this. I think we should have three. I think anointing with oil should be a full-blooded uh, sacrament. And the only reason why he says it's half a sacrament, because he, yes, the word sacrament is a human-made term. Okay, let's look at this. The word sacrament is a human-made category of rituals that we perform within the church. And uh, we Lutheran Christians say that it is, it is a gift of God that is given to us, it's a gift of God that has an outward sign. There's an outward sign of it. And it's also, here's the other thing that Luther would add, instituted by Christ. So I will tell you, you know, the, the Roman Catholic Church has a lot more sacraments than we do, and that's because they don't necessarily believe that has to have been instituted by Christ. It, it doesn't matter. It's just, that's how the, you know, sacrament is not a biblical word. It's just the way we categorize these these religious rituals. So the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church will uh, claim that uh, marriage is a sacrament. I've got no problems with that. It's just because it's how they define it. Now, we Lutherans have the three aspects. It's got to be something that was instituted by, you know, it's, it's a gift of God that is instituted by Jesus Christ, and there's an outward sign to it. It's those three elements. And he says, well, the anointing with oil is missing the element of being instituted by Christ. Well, I would disagree with that. I think Jesus Christ did ask us to pr uh, bring prayers for healing for people. And so I would say it's really kind of a full-blooded sacrament. I'm sorry to get into that rabbit hole. Um, don't need to go that way. But I think it's important to understand that prayer for those who are ill, prayer for those who are weak, is an important part of what we in the Church of Jesus Christ are supposed to do. So recall the elders, be participants in prayer for those of us who are sick, be anointed with oil. And what happens as a result of this? Well, James goes on. It's kind of spectacular. All right. The prayer of the faith will restore the one who is sick. Now, here's the interesting thing. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about the choice of this word. It, it says that it will restore the one who is sick. This is actually <laughs> the Greek word sozo, and it really, it's the same word that is used of salvation. James has something bigger in mind than their physical bodies. Um, our physical bodies our healing and our relationship with God, our restoration and our relationship with God is both physical and spiritual. We tend to, because we're, we, we fall into this mindset of the Greeks where we've got body, soul, and spirit. It's stupid. We are one human being. There's no such thing as a separate body from a spirit. We are not disembodied spirits trapped in a physical body. We are a physical body, okay? This is who we are. It's part of who we are, all right? And so salvation, this restoration, heals us. So James has a bigger picture in mind. We're healed in our relationship with God and one another, and which is why he's in, this is really interesting. What does he turn to? He then turns to sin. So the prayer of the faith will restore the person who's sick. The Lord will raise him up. So notice who the, action, the actor is. So we pray, but the Lord is the one who brings it. That's why I don't understand a faith healer supposedly gets rich off of faith healing people and praying for people. You're not doing it anyway. It's all from God. If anybody truly is healed, why are you getting rich? It's a gift that God has given you just to bless the church. Oh, my goodness. The Lord will raise them up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. So you notice James ties both our body and our soul as one unit. So we receive a physical curing of our bodies, a spiritual curing of our hearts, our relationship with God, because these things go together, okay? They go together. Therefore, he goes on, confess your sins, pray for one another so that you may be... Here's... This is, uh, again, this is verse um, 
16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now, this is interesting. I don't want to make too much of this. Um, this is a different Greek word. <laughs> uh, so, God is the one who restores us, brings us healing. But then he talks about our bodies we will be restored to health. So James acknowledges, I think, here, if, if you've been following some in our Gospel of Mark lessons that we've done on Sundays, Mark does this too. He does try to distinguish that wholeness that we receive from Jesus Christ from that physical cures that we receive. So he's talking about, yes, God is going to restore us, but you know, this body, which is only temporary, we don't get complete healing in this body, not until the Lord returns. So we may be healed, but we are not sozo, we are not saved in our bodies. Our bodies will still decay, we will still die. This is why physical healings, while we can pray for our physical cures, I should say, these heat types of healings, you know, are not to be, you know, God ultimately wants to completely heal our bodies, <clears throat> um, completely heal our relationships, sozo, save us. But in this life, the best we can hope for is a cure of our bodies. Okay? Because these bodies are still going to decay and die. So I don't want to make too much of this, but I think that's the reason why James changes the usage of that word here from sozo theomai when he's talking about our physical bodies. So at any rate, let's go on. He's talking also about sins, why we're supposed to confess to each other so that we, we, we're ultimately completely cured. A prayer of a righteous person was brought about can accomplish much. Now, Elijah, he goes on verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months. So he prayed again, and the sky then brought forth rain and produced, and the earth produced its fruit. So he again is trying to tell us the power of prayer. And by using the example of Elijah, Elijah's prayer, now I, I'm no Elijah, I can't imagine praying for the, 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 the sky, I've been asked to do this by the way, so there's no reason for me to do it, but Elijah was asked to pray for a drought, and a drought came for three and a half years, then he was prayed to, asked to pray for the rain to come, and the rain finally did come, and uh, so, you know, what, what James is trying to use as an illustration is that prayer is powerful, Prayer is powerful. And so when we pray for people, for healing, for salvation, these things will take place. Trust that they will happen. God will respond and save us. We'll respond to our prayers. So my brothers and sisters, verse 19, if any one of you strays from the truth and turns, someone turns him back, let him know that the one who's turned a sinner back from the air of his way will save the soul from the death and cover a multitude of sins. That seems an odd thing. Wait a minute. He seems like that seems like a tag on. What does this have to do with anything? Remember again, salvation, sozo, is more than just the curing of our bodies. It's a complete healing of us. Remember, we are not body, soul, and spirit, three different entities. Our body and our spirit, they're just one entity. Ultimately, what God wants to do is bring salvation into our lives, a totality, so that our bodies are completely healed, so that we no longer are decrepit and decay, so that we are healed in our relationships with each other. And so ultimately, James is trying to say, this is the point. To bring somebody back into relationship with God. This is where true salvation takes place. Pray. Because prayer has power. 
Let us pray. Our prayer is power, God, and so we're praying for healing, salvation in this world. We are living in a broken time where people are so angry with each other about things that five years ago no, from now nobody's going to care about. It's a hope. I'm just praying that you would bring healing to us. Heal us, God. For the rich, bring them to a time of confession. Well, I should qualify that. I'm rich. I'm not just talking spiritually. I am physically, monetarily rich compared to most people in this world. In fact, almost everybody who's listening to this Bible study today is probably standing under the indictment of James. We're blasted rich, and yet we think we're poor, and so we keep taking from the poor to prop ourselves up a little bit more, and we don't even realize we're part of that sick system. So we come in repentance this day, asking you to forgive us and help us to be more concerned about the needs and the concerns of the poor because they have suffered enough. And we pray for healing in our relationships, God, and peace in our world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.